Hi, my name is Manuel for Redshift and today I want to talk about rendering displacements inside of Redshift for Houdini. Displacement mapping is a very useful technique, especially when rendering on the graphics cards as it saves a lot of resources. You transfer all the intricate details of a high polygon mesh to a displacement map, uh, to a texture, and then leave it to the renderer to recreate the geometric detail on render time directly on the graphics card. Let's quickly switch to Houdini and see how we can set up displacement mapping. I already loaded my assets into a new Houdini scene. On the left you see the original 3D scan I created, and on the right you see the low poly retopo mesh I created in 3D code. And our goal is to render the right low poly mesh with the same detail as the original scan on the left. And that can be done using displacement. So to set up displacement, the first thing we want to do is create a shader. Let's switch to the sharp context. I already have a Redshift shader in here for the background and recreate a Redshift network and dive inside. Inside you find this Redshift material node that collects all the outputs of the network. We have a surface output for the surface data and a displacement port. And this is what we want to use. Um, I already baked the displacement map in 3D code. You can do so in Houdini too. And let's bring it in using a texture. So put down a texture and load the displacement map I already pre prepared. Before we apply it to the displacement port, we need a displacement node. It's called RS Displacement. And it tells Redshift the scaling of the displacement map, so the strength of the effect, so to speak. Now let's connect the texture to the texture input of the displacement node and the output of the displacement node to the displacement. Now that we have that, let's apply this material to our low poly object here under material. I choose from the shop context, the Redshift Wobnet and accept. And I have uh, applied the shader now. And what I can do now is switch to the render view. But before I can press the render button, the first thing we want to do is to add Redshift to Houdini and tell Houdini to use Redshift. That can be done by pressing this Redshift button here. Uh, this creates a redshift drop in the out context. Now that we have that, it gets automatically selected here for the render view, and we can select the camera I already prepared and press the render button. It takes a moment to generate the redshift scene, especially as I have the high poly stone in the scene, and then it shows us this image. On the left we see that we have a lot of intricate detail and on the right we have the low poly mesh, although we already applied the displacement shader. That is because to render displacements in Redshift there is uh, actually a second step involved. I have to tell the object that it should be displaced. So let's switch back to the object context and quickly fix this. If we want to tell Redshift how to handle individual objects, we cannot do so through the standard interface. We need more properties, Redshift properties, and these can be added through a shelf button. Here you find this object params button. If you press it, the parameters of the stone object get augmented by this object, Redshift object tab here. And inside you have a lot of different parameters regarding different features of Redshift. And one of the tabs is tessellation displacement. This is what we are interested in. And if you click this, you see you have two sections here, enable tessellation and en enable displacement. And at the moment, both are turned off. That's why we don't see any effect. Remember that the render view is still rendering. And as soon as I switch on enable displacement, what we can see is, boom, now we have all the detail here. But be careful. At the moment, this looks as if the detail is here. But if you have a close look at the silhouette of the object, it looks very, very bulky. And um, this is because at the moment it's actually doing a fake. It's doing bump mapping on a very low polygon displacement. We can see this as soon as we turn off enable auto bump mapping. I do this quickly and you see this is what gets actually displaced because we have a low poly model and Redshift is displacing the vertices of this low poly model. 
with uh, the information it finds in the displacement map. But as these vertices are not dense enough to really resemble all the detail, we get this result. What we have to do is to generate more geometry to be displaced, to be able to show more detail. And we can do so using this enable tessellation parameter. As soon as I click this, more geometry is generated and the displacement effect looks a lot better. What it's doing is it's actually just subdividing the geometry using the Catmull Clark subdivision rule, They're pretty much like the subdivision surface SOP in Houdini. But uh, the parameters are a little bit different. First, you have this subdivision rule. At the moment, it says Catmull Clark and loop. That's just using Catmull Clark for quads. And if it finds a triangle, it's using the loop scheme on this triangle. You can switch to Catmull Clark only for compatibility reasons. So if your host application does not support loop subdivision, you can use this. And then you have uh, this parameter here called minimum edge length. And this is a little bit different than standard subdivision surfaces because with subdivision surfaces, you usually specify the level of subdivision, meaning how often the geometry will get subdivided. Here we are dealing with something a little different, a little better, called adaptive subdivision. And that means it's subdividing the object as long as the edges are longer than the threshold here. This is very good because it gives a very even subdivision and uh, even spread of detail across the object. At the moment we have a four here. That means an edge gets subdivided as long as it is longer than four units. If I go smaller, let's say to two, you can immediately see that we get more detail. And if I get even smaller to one, I have pretty much all the detail in there because now all the edges will be smaller than one unit. It's very important to understand what units we are dealing with. At the moment, we are talking about screen space, and that is because of this checkbox here. It says screen space adaptive, and that's a very, very cool feature, because it uses the length of the edges after projection to the image plane. If I turn this off, look what happens all the detail is gone. And that is, of course, the case because now we are measuring in world space. So this one is referring to the world space units and one is a very large unit in world space in Houdini. So to get back the detail, we have to go a lot lower than one, let's say something like this, and a little bit of the detail is starting to appear again. But this is not the big difference between the two modes. This image here shows world space subdivision. You see that the polygons in the foreground seem bigger than in the background, but actually they are all pretty much the same size throughout the object because it's subdividing the object in world space. So it's just measuring the length of the edges and subdivide them until they are smaller than our threshold. But looking through the camera, the polygons in the background appear to be a lot smaller and we have a lot of dense detail here in the background and very large polygons here in the foreground. That means we generate far more geometry than we need. If we measure in screen space, so basically in this two-dimensional plane, this can be improved a lot. This is screen space adaptive subdivision. So now the lengths of the edges are measured in screen space after projection. And that means that the polygons get their size from the area they use in the screen space instead of world space. And this gives a very, very even subdivision and saves a lot of memory. Um, at the same time, we get the same amount of detail throughout the image in the background and in the foreground. And this is why this is the preferable setting in most cases. It renders quicker, it uses less RAM, and it gives better result. So switch back to one here and turn off screen space adaptive again, because this makes sure that no matter where we put our camera, we get always the same amount of detail for our displacement. And this is very good. So um, the parameters that are left to explain are smooth subdivision. That means if you turn it on, the subdivision will actually use Catmull Clark. If you turn it off, it's just a simple subdivision that can be useful for architectural models or hard surface models. And then you have this maximum subdivision slider here. And that is just saying um, whatever this minimum edge length parameter is doing, 
never go higher than a subdivision level of six. That's just a security setting to not overload the RAM with polygons. And then we have, to have this out of thrust room tessellation, and that is very cool too, because it gives uh, another optimization. It just says um, the stuff that is not directly seen by the camera can be tessellated less than the models that can be seen by the eye rays. Um, nevertheless, you can set it individually here because sometimes you have objects that are off screen, but can be seen in reflections. Um, then you can set it higher. And smooth UV boundaries finally says whether the UVs should be smoothed um, through the Catmull clock smoothing process or not. And here in the displacement section, you can say um, maximum displacement. That is basically analogous to the displacement bounds in Mantra, and it tells Redshift how big the largest displacement is. And you can scale the displacement. This is just a convenient setting. So the last thing that I did not explain in detail is the auto bump mapping. And um, I will show you what this is exactly doing now, because this is, again, a very, very cool and unique feature. Although we have a one here and we are generating a lot of geometry, and although the detail looks okay, it's not 100% where the original scan was. But look what happens if I check this enable auto bump mapping. Now it's really exactly the same. Magically, a lot of detail appeared. And um, this is using a trick. It's actually doing a bump map on top of the re displaced result. It's doing a frequency separation and it's dividing the displacement map into low frequency details and high frequency details. And all the high frequency details that cannot be represented by the level of subdivision are just bumped. So if I go a lot higher here, say back to four, you see that you pretty much don't see any difference. The only difference you can spot is the boundary of the object, the silhouette. It gets a little bit less detailed, but other than that, it's pretty much the same. And that means you're saving a lot of resources while generating the same visual quality. What I did manually here in Photoshop is what actually happens inside of Redshift. So if I disable this layer here with a high frequency detail, you see these are the low frequency details. This is all the large structures in the texture. These get displaced. And then if I turn on the high frequency detail, you see this is the high frequency detail layer. This is the stuff that cannot be represented through actual geometric displacement. This will be, this will get bumped if you use auto bump mapping. And uh, then you get the result of both together. So without high frequency and with high frequency. So thank you very much. I hope you learned something and happy rendering in Redshift.